There are many dead measurements, and I like to look them up because they are funny. One pood, of course, once equaled 40 funts, of course, which equaled about 16.39 kilograms. Uh, the Hobbit was equal to four pecks, or two and a half bushels. <laughs> Duh, and it was used in Wales for a long time. And one butt equaled 570 liters of wine. I'm a man that drinks wine. I drink quite a bit of wine, and I calculated that I consume about a butt of wine every four years. How much butt do you drink? Hello and welcome to Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to the main Because Science series where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections about everything we've gotten up to on the previous week on this channel, and then I address them in a just a ridiculously comfy t-shirt that you can now own. Also, I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint! But first, on the last episode of Because Science, I was bringing you the physics and the history behind the closest thing to a Fallout-style mini-nuke that humans have ever made, the Davy Crockett weapon system. It was a nuclear warhead and a recoilless rifle that you could pick up with your own two hands by yourself and launch it not really off your shoulder like a fat man, but pretty close to it, and it's surprisingly accurate for a sci-fi video game. But what did you have to say? The first comment comes from OG Super Nerd Matterbeam, who says, Hello, it's been a while. Hmm, yes. They don't sound like that. I'd like to remark that the critical mass of plutonium can be as low as 6.2 kilograms when high explosives are used to compress it to over twice its density, which is ridiculous enough if you think about it. Compressing a metal so that it is more dense is hard to do. It should yield about 12 to 15 kilotons per kilogram, but small nuclear devices are incredibly inefficient and dirty. Less than 1% of the nuclear material undergoes fission. This means that 99% of the plutonium or uranium is just vaporized and dispersed into the environment. Every small nuclear device is a dirty bomb. Good thing Matterbeam doesn't host this show because I have nothing to add. Our next comment comes from Wim Tembrink, who says, changed your hair? Did it start to fall out? <laughs> no, but seriously, do you know why radiation makes people's hair fall out when you are exposed to high levels of radiation or you get something like radiation therapy if you're unfortunate enough to have a kind of cancer? It's because radiation affects the DNA in our cells. That ionizing radiation can go into our DNA and knock components of it around such that the cell mutates or even decides to go under apoptosis and destroy itself because it has so many problems with it. Radiation does that more often to cells that have more opportunities to divide. If you had a population of cells that were dividing very, very rapidly, then that just increases the number of times radiation could mutate some of those cells. And which cells in our bodies divide the most? Those are the cells that produce our hair. Those are the cells that produce our stomach lining, which is why in radiation therapy, people experience extreme nausea because the radiation is disproportionately affecting those rapidly dividing cells in your stomach, the cells that have to deal with hydrochloric acid baths all day. That's why they divide so much because so many are dying. But radiation-induced hair loss is because radiation is affecting those rapidly dividing cells in your body. And that's why we use radiation to get at something like cancer because it's a rapidly dividing mass of cells. So I get your pun, but we can learn our next comment comes from Cody Kearsay, who says science never changes. Wait, no, it totally does all the time. Well, I said physics. Physics never changes, and that's a big difference, at least in my mind. The great thing about science is that it does change. It's a progressive body of knowledge. Our scientific understanding of some phenomena or the universe will change in accordance with the evidence and the data that we have. But something like physics, like physical laws and constants in the universe are immutable. They do not change over time. Our understanding of them and what they mean and how to fit them together with uh, the rest of our understanding may change, but the fundamental way that the universe works doesn't change. That has nothing to do with us. It does not care. So physics, physics never changes, but science, science does. And that's why it works so well. 
Our next comment comes from Jacob Fuller, who says, is it possible to reverse radiation or remove it? What I mean is, have we discovered a way to make an area impacted by nuclear radiation habitable again in a short amount of time? Half lives are very long, much longer than I can live, I think. Well, yes, if radiation has contaminated the air or the water or the soil, you have to go in and physically remove that media or else it will just continue to be radioactive and be dangerous to people and to make places uninhabitable. We do have organizations like Superfund in the United States that go to radioactive places and dig up radioactive soil and put it away and store it in like inside of a mountain and stuff like that. Um, so you can remove radiation. You just have to know where it is and it can't be too horribly much or else you cannot get in there as human beings in the first place without robots and stuff like that. That's why nuclear uh, bombs can be so scary is that if you put enough radioactive contamination into an area, into a city, you wouldn't even be able to go into it to clean it up and it would be uninhabitable for thousands of years uh, according to the half-lives like you said and that's why we do not want to go to war like in Fallout. Our next comment comes from Nicholas Hogan, who says, what is the ruling on the popular myth that the Vault Boys thumbs up sign is a way to measure if you're safe from a nuclear blast? All right, so the common myth um, advanced by Fallout and other things in media is that Vault Boy is doing this with one eye closed because he was using his thumb as a scale. And the thumb is a scale to see how big the mushroom cloud in front of him is. And if it's smaller than your thumb, you know, proportionally at the distance that you're at, then you are safe from the radiation and the blast effects. Thumbs up, you're good to go. Now, as far as I can find, this is indeed a myth that has been debunked numerous times. And if we want to be even more clear on the fact that this is a myth, uh, someone at Inverse contacted the U.S. Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, and they put it bluntly, we have been unable to find any truth to the internet rumor, end quote. So yes, it is a myth. <laughs> Our next comment comes from Ryan Alexander Bloom, who says, I live just a few miles away from where they invented the atom bomb. There are drones and satellites monitoring this area 24 seven. The Google maps of this area are slightly obscured, so you can't see the labs fully. They're probably reading this post right now as I type it. Good old Los Alamos. I wonder if they're watching me because of all the times I typed how to make a nuclear bomb smaller into Google. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Copper Hamster, who says, a lot, basically going through all of the steps in exploding a fusion bomb. He, she, they concludes with the problem with a bomb like the Davy Crockett's is that it was very, very compact and lightweight. And as such, a lot of the tricks they use for improving yields, levitated pits, high mass dampers, tritium priming, were not usable at that scale. So it was really, really dirty. Add to that to the fact, add that to the fact that if you want a dirtier bomb, bomb, more fallout, you detonate it at or near the ground so it sucks dirt up into the cloud and attach radioactive particles to it, and it wasn't a realistically usable weapon because of that. Sure, it was deployed, but they would have been crazy to use them. There is so much great detail here, Copper Hamster. It looks like you're writing one of my episodes in full just in a YouTube comment, and for that, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> But of course, I'm not always right. I'm not a working scientist. I'm not Neil deGrasse Tyson, which is a show that I would watch. So what did I get wrong this week? Don't steal that show. I mean, I know that it, this is on the internet now, but that's my show. Our first correction is by far the biggest one, and it comes from a lot of you, and you all say, hey Kyle, this is a Fallout video. You can't fast travel near enemies like you did in that video. What are you thinking? To which I have to say, you're right. It's a Fallout video. It was probably just an infrequent glitch. Sorry. Our next correction comes from Hots Kaufman, which I must admit, it's a pretty cool name, dude, who says, the US military has nuclear howitzer shells smaller than the Davy Crockett. So yes, Hots, I think what you're referring to is the W-48 American nuclear artillery shell, and it was smaller in diameter than the Davy Crockett's warhead, but it was much heavier. The reason why I said the Davy Crockett is as close as you can get to a real Fallout mini nuke is because you can pick it up by yourself, it looks similar to the warhead that's in the game, it can be fired by a three-man team, kind of with like a recoilless gun that's like a fat man, kind of. 
it's not the smallest nuclear weapon that exists full stop, but it is the closest one to the fat man mini nuke system, I think. So you are right, but also what I said. Our next correction comes from Ozan, who says, Dearest Kyle, I'm warning you, you either use only metric units or imperial units. Please do not use one in one scene and the other at the next scene. You shall obey this unwritten codex or there shall be unforeseen consequences. Love from City 70. Oh, it's always oh, referencing a Half-Life thing. Look. Sometimes I pick Imperial and metric units, and often I try to have both in the video. If I ever say something is X kilograms, I also say that means it's X pounds because we have an international audience and I don't want to exclude anyone. But in this video, I use almost exclusively Imperial and not metric like I usually do, and that's on me. I think that comes down to my engineering degree, which most things are imperial, at least in the classes that I took for engineering and bridges and rivers and that kind of thing. And two, all the material that I was going through for nuclear weapons, these nuclear weapons were developed in the United States by scientists working and living in the United States, and a lot of those values are imperial. So that probably just bled into my brain, but you're right, I should be more inclusive in my units, and metric is better, so, but the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm going to give to username, I don't like it, Swollen Nutty, who says, okay, so I'm being super nitpicky here. However, use the term critical in referring to what happens when uranium atoms split and release about two and a half neutrons, causing further fissions. Well, that's not 100% true. In nuclear reactor, going critical refers to a constant power output. So even though each uranium atom releases more than one neutron per fission, not all neutrons go on to cause more fissions as you described in your branching diagram. If power output is rising, the term is called supercritical. That is the number of fissions occurring in the next generation is higher than the previous. Sorry for the long comment. Love the series. Thank you. Let's sort this out. So say you had two neutrons introduced into this subcritical material. They are more likely than not to miss or be absorbed and not hit another fissile atom and sustain the chain reaction. Now let's say you had material that was critical. Now you have the material in such a configuration that when a neutron is introduced, it will more likely than not, hit another atom, which will produce another neutron, which will go off and hit another atom, which will sustain itself in a chain reaction like this. And in a supercritical material, at every step in this chain reaction, the output is increasing, like a runaway release of energy with neutrons going everywhere. So that's the difference, kind of, and expertly knowing the difference is the difference between just a hunk of metal and a nuclear bomb. Nuclear weapons engineers got really, really good at determining all the little conditions, the temperatures, the geometric orientation of all this material so that they can induce criticality and make it go critical and super critical whenever they wanted to. That's the scary power of these weapons. And for making me think about all of that, I'm not gonna say your name. You are indeed a super nerd. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is gonna be because you got it two days earlier than anyone else and you got other premium content from Nerdist and Geek and Sundry and myself. You even saw, maybe, Orbital Redux, I think? The live sci-fi show that's 10 cameras and really, really cool that I was also a part of a little bit? Yeah, how you like that B-roll. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode is about the night Gwen Stacy died. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are going back to one of the most famous comic panels of all time and analyzing what would really happen if Spider-Man tried to catch the love of his life with a lifeline of spider web using actual engineering properties for spider silk, should Gwen Stacy actually be alive? Would she have survived? The answer might interest you. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science all about mini nukes if you haven't yet, and leave me all your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, I'm reading it right off the screen, and at because science on Instagram and 
Mm, I think it's pronounced Twitar. Also, you can get one of these shirts if you really want it. It's super comfortable, and people will know that you're very nerdy. And if you're subscribed to Alpha, you get 10% off. Also, we have a subreddit. Also, don't forget, I don't have any like fun quote to analyze for this one. So I'm going to attempt to make a very memorable quote myself right now, which is to say, hey, the universe is big. It's fine getting lost in it. Eh? Put it on a shirt!